Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, the death toll from the intercommunal clashes in Sudan's West Darfur rises to 56 after days of clashes and the latest outbreak of violence between rival communities. Also, securities beefed up around the Nigerian town where gunmen stormed a prison, freeing over 1,800 inmates this week. The community's been tense and fears that they could be caught up in efforts to hunt down the SKPs. And closer than close, Cape Town surfers take to the waves without boards or buoyancy aids, riding the waters using only their own bodies. We hear more from the town's body surfers. But first, clashes in Western Darfur are getting worse. At least 56 people have been killed in the Sudanese state and a state of emergency has been declared, declared there this week. The latest flare-up of fighting around El Ganaina between the Mesalit and Arab communities has led to gunfire and shelling. Over 100,000 have fled their homes since mid-January. Naba Mohideen joins us now with more from Khartoum. Naba, first of all, give us a bit of an overview. Tell us more about what's happening in West Darfur for, and what prompted this latest spiral of intercommunal violence. Uh, what's happening is a tribal conflict. It's a resurgent tribal conflict that uh, takes place a lot of times and happens a lot of times. And the death toll right now is 56 due to the medics. And uh, the number of casualties is 132. Um, also, medical groups are reporting a lot of uh, dead bodies without uh, any ability of accessing it because of the violence and the lack of security uh, in all over the state. After the emergency state uh, has been uh, imposed in the state, um, there is no um, real restrictions or uh, security and military uh, presence in the state. So people are afraid, people are uh, kept in their houses, some people are fleeing even the, the uh, surrounding villages to the neighboring towns. And the medical groups cannot even do their work due to the lack of the staff and the medical support and the total absence of any security forces. So you've just given, a bit, given us a bit of a picture there of just how bad things have become. But bearing in mind how much of a priority brokering peace deals in, uh, in the region has been for the, been for the government, why do you think things have managed to deteriorate quite so far in Western Darfur anyway? Actually, the conflict with Darfur is really complicated. It's erupted uh, in 2003 because of the tribal clashes that very well known between Arab tribes and non-Arab tribes. And the thing that fuel it and make it resurgent and renewable is the former regime uh, empowering the Arab militias against non-Arab militias. So people right now, uh, there is a peace agreement, but there is no... Um, seclusion or implementation of it in the ground. There is a lack of security. People, they doesn't... Uh, trust the, any military or security forces. And there is a withdrawal of uh, peacekeeping mission that should, be, uh, that should be replaced with a new UN mission very soon. And also the military, right now, there is not uh, a, a lot of uh, military troops around the state. So there is a lack of, uh, there is a feel of lack of justice, a feeling of a lack of justice, and there is a feeling of, the peace agreement doesn't fulfill what uh, the displaced people and the d different tribes need. It doesn't address their real problems. So the conflict is resurgent and happens all the time. And it needs a real uh, solution or we will see it again and again. And uh, one evidence of that, that the same events took place in January where 129 people were killed for the same reasons and for the same conflict. So um, a peacekeeping mission and a real and efficient solution uh, will be the only solution for ending the conflict in the, in the four region. Thanks so much. Naba Mohedin there speaking to us from Khartoum. Well, look now at some news in brief and we stay with Sudan. The country's cabinet has voted to repeal a law that forbade diplomatic relations with Israel. It follows Khartoum's agreement last year to normalize relations with Israel after striking a deal known as the Abraham Accords brokered by the former US Trump administration. The move still has to be approved by the country's interim legislative body to come into effect. At least 100 people have been killed in border clashes between Ethiopia's Afar and Somali regions. 
Both sides are blaming each other for starting the violence which first broke out last Friday. In 2014, the boundary between the two states was redrawn by the federal government. Since then, Somalia has been trying to transfer back three towns that were redesignated to Afar's jurisdiction. That's fed into clashes over the disputed boundary between rival militia. The latest round of talks between Egypt, Sudan and Addis Ababa over the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam have failed. Ministers from the three nations met in Kinshasa, DR Congo, in a bid to settle on an approach to filling in and operating Africa's largest hydroelectric power plant. The long-running dispute has seen Cairo and Khartoum worry that the Ethiopian project may threaten their access to the waters of the Nile River. Now, security has been beefed up around the Nigerian town of Iweri after gunmen stormed a prison there and freed 1,844 inmates. The community has been tense ever since, fearing that they could be caught up in, the secu- in security forces' efforts to hunt down the escaped prisoners. Norbert Shekhar tells us more. A spectacular jailbreak in Nigeria's southeast. The walls of Iweri prison still bore the blackened marks of explosives, after being targeted by a carefully orchestrated attack. A group of men armed with rocket launchers and rifles stormed the compound Monday morning and engaged the guards in a gun battle. The assailants then used explosives to free hundreds of inmates, allowing over 1,800 prisoners to escape. They also raided the town's police headquarters, looting its armory and torching dozens of vehicles. Speaking from London, where he was receiving treatment for an unspecified illness, Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari called the attack an act of terrorism and ordered a full mobilization of security forces to find and punish the culprits. The federal government will use every available tool at its disposal to confront and terminate this barefaced anarchy. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack, Yet Nigerian police says it suspects the indigenous people of Biafra, a separatist organization that's becoming increasingly active in the country's southeast. A spokesperson for the group rejected any involvement in the assault. Now, the pandemic's made it harder to look after endangered species. Without a steady flow of income from tourism, Namibia, home to most of the world's black rhino, has found it harder to keep special anti-poaching units running. Take a look. This is a unit, an anti-poaching unit. Years ago, Namibian farmers and conservationists have set up these groups to protect an endangered species, the black rhinoceros. This close protection, which has helped save animals, is funded by tourism revenues. But now that COVID-19 has brought tourism crashing down, locals have little money left for endangered animals. We are actually at the brink of going bankrupt. Um, we are really, really struggling to pay everything. We, uh, during Corona time, we had to let, unfortunately, had to let a few people go. The obvious threat now is to see poachers come back especially after a year of COVID, when tough security measures have slowed down illegal trafficking of endangered species horns. It enrages me to take such a, such a, um, a, a valuable life, which just for this piece of dust, I mean, it's dust, it's just, it's just nothing, um, and I kill for it. Rhino's horns may be worthless to law-abiding citizens, but to traffickers, they're worth millions of dollars. Because in some countries in Asia, like China, they symbolize wealth. Next to them, even gold comes cheap. So conservationists are watching over Namibia's 6,000 rhinos as close as they still can. Well, Cape Town surf purists are ditching anything that gets between them and the waves. A passionate community ride the waters using nothing but their own bodies, and it looks exhausting. Take a look. At first glance, this is a typical early morning scene out in the bay in Cape Town. But these are not your average surfers. Using little more than their bodies in a wetsuit, boards nowhere to be seen. These are body surfers. Freedom, absolute freedom. Just you and the surf 
figure out where, where you have to be, what you have to do, and just ride the wave, ride the, ride the ocean. It's, it's about being just you in the sea, it's great. Just a child, yeah? Just nothing serious about it, it's just fun. Some body surfers use small paddles in the water to better navigate a wave and stay stable. But in this strip back sport, you can never blame a bad session on the equipment. I think it's more about positioning, putting yourself in the right position to catch the wave and you're in the right position on the wave. Yeah. The simplicity of body surfing makes it a good bet for the oldest water gliding sport. From what we know, uh, you know, body surfing has a long history into pre-colonial Polynesian culture and even into pre-colonial African uh, culture, the coastal cultures, which have documented ships records when the Europeans were coming to do the early voyage of discovery and starting to trade along the west coast of Africa. When he isn't in the water, Quibis Yobert makes surfboards, bodyboards and hand slides, the small paddles used by some body surfers. Even if they sell well, the market is small compared to classic surfing and big brands have no real interest in the sport. I think it's just that the, the big companies, the big corporates have not really discovered it. I think it's too basic, it's too simple. And in my words, it's too pure for them because there's too little product. There's too little probably profit for them to make. Body surfing remains a low key activity, far removed from the glamorous and trendy image of surfing. And that is exactly what Niels Havenhaar loves about it. He is the only surfer out on this reef for the day. I guess I've always liked it because there's less people do it. So it's not as crowded, it's easier. And it's safer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Have you ever done it? You should. It's fun. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care. I literally. <laughs>